Thank you, Brother Randell. Ladies, you will hang in there with me just for a minute. It's good to have the opportunity to preach for you again this evening. And uh, this is not the sermon that I had intended to preach tonight. I was working on this for another date. But then, uh, based on the sermon that Brother Randell and Brother Scott preached uh, Sunday, I thought it was appropriate, and I think that you will find it appropriate also. But it's another hymn story, and uh, let's start off with the story. The dying words of an Episcopal clergyman inspired a Presbyterian minister to write a poem. Set to a tune originally composed for a secular song, it has become the most militant hymn American Christendom has yet produced. The Episcopalian was young Dudley Atkins Ting, as bold, fearless, and uncompromising a preacher as his distinguished father, the Reverend Stephen H. Ting. Following his graduation from college and seminary and several years as his father's assistant at the Church of the Epiphany in Philadelphia, Dudley held pastorates of his own in several eastern cities before settling down as his father's successor in the large and wealthy Philadelphia church in 1854, his 29th year. Although success as an author as well as a preacher soon followed, Dudley Ting was not the kind of minister who pulled his punches. As the anti-slavery sentiment grew, he expressed his convictions about the matter from the pulpit. Consequently, before his second year was up, there were loud rumblings from the more conservative members of the congregation. Outspoken critics were demanding his removal. At the suggestion of some of the younger progressive leaders, Ting resigned from the Church of the Epiphany as of November the 4th, 1856. With a group of faithful followers, he organized the Church of the Covenant, securing a hall on Filbert Street as a meeting place. Meanwhile, he moved with his family to a country home a mansion house in the Brookfield section of Montgomery County. In addition to his duties as pastor of a new growing congregation, Team began noonday lectures at the YMCA. As his fame grew, larger and larger crowds waited upon his sermons and addresses. His boldness only increased his popularity and effectiveness. On Tuesday, March the 30th, 1858, over 5,000 men gathered in James Hall then at 621 Chestnut Street for a mass meeting sponsored by the Y. Ting preached from Exodus 10, 11, which says, Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord. Over 1,000 of the men were converted. The sermon was called one of the most successful of the times. The entire city was being aroused. A religious awakening was gaining force. Now during the sermon, the preacher said, I must tell my master's errand, and I would rather that this right arm were amputated at the trunk than that I should come short of my duty to you in delivering God's message. The next week, he returned to his family in the country. On Tuesday, April the 13th, 1858, he was witnessing the operation of a corn thrasher in his barn. Raising his arm to place his hand on the head of a mule which was walking up the inclined plane of the machine, the loose sleeve of his morning gown was caught between the cogs. The arm was lacerated severely and the main artery severed and the median nerve injured. Four days later, mortification having set in, his right arm was amputated very close to the shoulder. Anxiety propelled for his life, but two days later, the shock to his system proved fatal. So I'd like to have the ladies play a verse in the course of this song. Thank you, ladies, very much. It's a snappy little song to be born out of tragedy, isn't it? <laughs> it just seems like all of these great hymns have a tragic element to them, uh, which, which I guess that's the way the Lord spoke to these people that wrote these songs. Now, continuing on with the story, the newspapers gave a detailed account of young Dudley Ting's passing, including his request to his faithful wife that she use her influence to bring their boys up in the ministry. The reporter wrote, taking his aged father's hand, he said with much earnestness, stand up for Jesus, father, stand up for Jesus. 
and tell my brethren of the ministry, wherever you meet them, to stand up for Jesus. Thus he died on Monday between 1 and 2 o'clock, surrounded by his family with his intellect unclouded and his faith in the happy change that was awaiting him, bright and clear and earnest. The Reverend George Duffield, Jr., then pastor of the Temple Presbyterian Church, Philadelphia, heard the account of his friend's passing at a memorial service at James Hall. He said, Ting was one of the noblest, bravest, and manliest men I have ever met. The following Sunday morning, he preached to his people from Ephesians 6.14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. For his conclusion, he read an original poem of six stanzas, which he explained had been inspired by the dying words of his co-worker. The poem began, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed." At this time, if you would stand with me and open your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 25. Let's all stand together for the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 25. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 25 says, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under under his feet. The title of my sermon this evening is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I pray that you will be with us this evening as we study your word and that we will be encouraged, Lord, to stand up for you. And in the face of the enemy that seems to be all around us, that we will stand up and be accounted for and that we will not uh, run away, that we will not hide, but we will stand up and stand up for you. And we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Now, we won't turn there this evening, but um, this opening verse, the context of that is the 1,000-year reign Paul's talking about here that we often refer to as the millennium or the millennial reign, and that's referenced in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. After the millennial reign, there will be a final rebellion led by Satan himself, and that's also recorded in Revelation 27 through 10, in which Jesus will crush and finally and forever put all his enemies under his feet. However, in the meantime... Christians are to stand up and fight against Satan and all of his demons, and there seems to be plenty of those to fight against these days. My sermon this evening has four points, and the first one is this. Stand up and bear Christ's banner. Now, in Civil War times, uh, no duty was more honorable or more dangerous than that of the color or flag bearer. And as you can imagine, that was a pretty dangerous job because the flag bearer had to lead his regiment, his part of the army, into the battle. And there were no radios or anything like that. And many times the gunfire was just so loud, it smoked so much that you couldn't hear anybody talking to you. So you just had to focus on the flag. And the flag was held high, and you just had to follow the flag. And so wherever the flag went is where you went. Of course, if the, uh, for the enemy, they wanted to kill the flag bearer. Uh, and, of course, the flag bearer couldn't carry a gun. He had to carry the flag. And so the flag bearer was unarmed. So there were typically uh, uh, what was called the honor guard, that their job was to guard the flag bearer. And if the flag bearer got shot, then another member of the honor guard, their job was to pick up the flag and keep going. And as you can imagine, a complete honor guard could be wiped out in a single battle. All right, so uh, that's, that's a pretty tough job as far as that goes. But nothing was more important than being the color bearer and, wa and waving that banner for the army. Now, the first verse of the hymn goes like this, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. By the way, it's on page 502 in the hymn, if you want to follow along. We're going to look at all the verses. Uh, From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Well, what exactly is Jesus' royal banner as mentioned in that hymn, in that first verse of that hymn? What is Jesus' royal banner? Well, perhaps another song comes to mind. His banner over me is love. Exactly right. Turn to Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 4. Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 4. Song of Solomon, chapter 2 and verse 4 says, He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Now, the context of this verse is uh, Solomon's wife talking about him, but I believe this is an allegory of what Christ does for his believers. 
Christ shows us his love. The banqueting house Christ brings us to is the place where believers receive his graces and his blessings. This is where we meet with Christ. The banner that is lifted up is the love of Christ, demonstrated by his crucifixion on the cross for us and displayed for all to see. So how do we lift up his royal banner? Well, we proclaim Christ's love for us by spreading the good news of the gospel to everyone we can. God raised up his matter for us by dying on the cross. We display his matter by telling other people of his love. That's how we do it. The first point was just that, stand up and bear Christ's banner. The second point is this, stand up and attack the enemy. Stand up and attack the enemy. Now, my second illustration also involves a civil war. Civil war. I'm not sure why, but I love the Civil War. Uh, I don't know anybody that fought in the Civil War. We lost, the we, the South, lost the Civil War. So I should have a grudge about the Civil War, but I don't. I don't take it personally that we lost. But I like Civil War history, and I like especially Gettysburg. Maybe I like Gettysburg more because I've been there a couple of times. When we were stationed in D.C., we had a chance of going there. And then uh, every other year, we go over to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is right near Gettysburg. And one of the times over there, we had a chance to go when the kids were a little bit older, and it's just a, a cool place. Anybody ever been to Gettysburg? Anybody else ever been to Gettysburg? It's, it's a really cool place. You've ever had a chance to go. And if you like history, man, that's the place to go. Uh, that's really cool. All right. Um, I've also read the book Killer Angels a couple of times. Has anybody else ever read the book Killer Angels? Brother John, anybody else? Summer has? Outstanding. You probably had to read it in the military. Does that know? Yeah. And so uh, it's an awesome book. If you have, uh, I've got probably three or four copies around the house you could borrow. Uh, it's a really, really good book, but it's, it's, it, it's the Battle of Gettysburg uh, that was made into a movie, Gettysburg. So if you've seen Ted Turner's movie, Gettysburg, it's a four hour long movie, kind of long, but I've probably seen it. I don't know, a dozen times. Uh, so it's a really good movie. But it talks about Gettysburg, seen from both sides of the view. But in that movie, uh, there's a scene uh, uh, on the second day of battle where Colonel Joshua Chamberlain uh, from a main regiment is on the far, would be the Union's left flank, the far left flank. And he has to hold that position or the, the whole Union Army will be uh, outflanked and will collapse. Okay, so it's a very uh, p critical position that he has to maintain. Well, through the fight, uh, uh, you, uh, southern soldiers from Alabama, and Mississippi, and Georgia, they're all fighting up, up Little Round Top to try to overcome that position. And Chamberlain and his men keep fighting them back and keep fighting them back till finally they're out of ammunition. They, they don't have any bullets left to fight with. More than half of the men have been killed. And it just seems like the next time the uh, South attacks, they're going to overrun that position. And it seems surely that's what's going what's to happen. Well, Chamberlain, realizing how important it was to hold the position, decides to attack. So he orders all of his men to fix bayonets. And then they charge downhill with no bullets. And they drive the south off the mountain, and through that, they win a major victory, probably determine the outcome of the war by doing that. But the point to make there is that he didn't sit there and do nothing, okay? He knew the enemy was out there, and he attacked the enemy. He went on the offensive. And so the second verse goes like this, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict, and this his glorious day. Ye that are men, now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger, and strength to strength oppose. Now, God gives us the power to conquer Satan. We, he's already beaten. He just doesn't know it. Maybe he does know it. He just doesn't want to give up. Turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. And that says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, this verse, in this verse, Jesus is referring back to Genesis 3.15 when God is telling Satan, and I'll, I'll just read it for you. Genesis 3.15 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. These verses are promises of victory over the power of sin. These verses are promises of victory over all the power of the enemy. And with Christ on our side, Satan is already defeated. We just need to get in the fight. Because only then can we hope to win lost souls for the Lord. We can't win 
lost souls sitting on the sideline. We have got to get in the fight. Got to. First, first, first point was stand up and bear Christ's manner. Second point was stand up and attack the enemy. The third point is this. Stand up and put on your gospel armor. Now, I was hoping Dan might be here tonight, but he's not here. But how many of you have to wear body armor or ballistic vests? Did you have to wear that in your, either when you were deployed? I don't know if Tony's here even. Billy, you had to. Anybody else ever had to wear any of that kind of stuff? I never had to in any of the jobs that I had. But, of course, police officers have to wear it uh, all the time, all right? Well, ballistic vests have been a staple of law enforcement since a surge in police shootings in the mid to light, late 1960s. So that's a long time ago. But in the last three decades, body armor has saved the lives of more than 3,000 police officers. That's just in the United States. So it's safe to say tens of thousands of lives have been saved worldwide. Surveys show that by not wearing ballistic armor, police officers have 14 times the risk of dying of an injury. I would think that would be 100 times uh, more dying of injury, but apparently you can get shot and survive. Uh, so some people do. Uh, not a lot, I would think, but a lot of people do. Um, now, who wants to get shot without body armor? Uh, not me. You know, if, I, if I'm a policeman, I want to wear my body armor, but surprisingly, some officers prefer not to wear ballistic armor, and some departments don't require them to. Issues such as comfort, mobility, undercover operations, and cost are among the alleged concerns. Going into battle without your armor is a choice you can make, but it's not a very wise one because the chances of surviving a gunshot without a ballistic vest goes way down, and so does your effectiveness as a combatant. So the third verse goes like this. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor. Each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Well, what exactly is the gospel armor then? What is the gospel armor and do we have access to it? Well, the Bible tells us exactly what it is. And it's in Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10. If you want to turn there, I'll read that for you. Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Therefore, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shone with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, these verses clearly tell us that the gospel of armor consists of the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. Now, we have access to all of those. We have access to all of those, not through Walmart, not through Cabela's, where we can get a discount, but through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and his word, the Bible. Remember, Jesus is our captain, and it's him that we follow into battle. He wants to make sure we are ready for battle by giving us the proper armor. Who wants to lead someone into battle if they don't have their armor on? You're just going to get killed, and then you have to be taken care of. You know, you're not even help then. We have to put on the armor, and if we put on the armor, then God will lead us into battle. We just follow him. So, if we put on the gospel armor, as we are prepared to, uh, we will be able to stand up for Jesus. First point was stand up and bear Christ's banner. Second point, stand up and attack the enemy. Third point, stand up and put on your gospel armor. And the last point is this, stand up and finish strong. Stand up and finish strong. This last illustration is a personal one. Some of you may know this, but I retired from the Air Force back in 2003. It seems like a long time ago. But I retired as a captain, uh, but I didn't start off as a captain or an officer. I started off as an enlisted troop. And uh, uh, as a enlisted troop, uh, I went to school at night and, went and earned a, a computer science degree. And then with, with a bachelor's degree in hand, uh, uh, the Air Force enabled me to apply for officer training school, OTS. And uh, I was accepted for OTS, fortunate to do that. And so I was down in San Antonio, Texas. That's where OTS was at at the time. It's in Alabama now. Uh, but at the time, it was in San Antonio, Texas. Pretty hot down there. Uh, I was there in the fall, though, so it wasn't quite as bad. 
But uh, we had to do a lot of running. And one of the things that we had to do uh, before we graduated was run a mile and a half in a certain amount of time. And we run that mile and a half on a track, an oval track that's a quarter of a mile long. So we had to run six laps on this quarter of a mile track, as you can imagine, right? Now, it's not a lot of fun running on an oval track. It's not much fun at all. But that's, that's the way we had to do it, and so that's, that's what we did. Well, as it turned out, they had a little competition to see who the fastest runners were in each of the squadrons. There were only two squadrons there, and so I, I, I was okay, a runner. I really was not one of the fastest runners, but I was picked as one of the three guys in our squadron to compete in this race. And so there was just us three on the track, and so we took off. And uh, uh, as soon as we took off, the, there were the two other guys uh, that, were, that were younger. I was, again, prior enlisted, so I was a little older. Uh, than these other guys. And uh, they took off ahead of me, and uh, they probably got 20, 30 yards ahead of me right from the beginning. Uh, but I had done enough running to know what I could do and what I couldn't do. And so I just kept, kept them in my view. I stayed about 20, 30 yards behind them the whole time. And so we just click off the laps, you know, two, three, four, five laps down. And on the last lap, I had a, a little bit left in the tank, and so I, I kicked it up a gear. And I was behind them, so they couldn't really see me. And so I took off, and uh, I still don't know how I did it, except maybe the Lord. And, uh, and on the last turn of the last lap, I passed both those guys and finished first in the race. And boy, I tell you, I wish I could have had a camera to get the look on those guys' faces, uh, because they were racing each other. You know, they thought they, you know, one of those two were going to win it. And then when I passed them, they were, they were shocked. Now, I, you know, I'm, I'm not that fast a guy. Uh, it's just that I happen to finish strong, I finish the race strong, and that's the point I want to make, is that, you know, we're in a long race. We're, you know, if it was a 100-mile, 100 100-yard sprint, that'd been one thing, right? But these long-distance races, you have to pace yourself, right? And all of us are in different stages of life, and we can't burn ourselves out uh, in our early years of life, and we can't quit in our later years of life. We need to pace ourselves, but in the end, we need to finish strong. Right? Finish faithful, finish strong. You know, don't leave it. For those of us that are older, and I'm starting to get in that category, I won't be like Brother Paul and deny that I'm getting old. Uh, um, I, you know, I, we're, we're getting there. It's, you know, I, it's, I, it's sneaking up on me. And, but I want to finish strong. I, I want to be considered a faithful servant. And, um, you know, I don't want to leave it to somebody else to do. As long as I can work, as long as I can do something, then I want to do that. And I think that's what the Lord would want us to do, right? The last verse says, stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the king of glory shall reign eternally. Now, Jesus was a finisher, and he wants us to be finishers too. If you turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, and let's read, let's start with verse 1, and then we'll read through verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll start with verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we all saw are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now Jesus finished, and there were many obstacles in front of him. But now, look at the, what awaited for him. He's sitting in heaven at the right hand of God. And when we finish the race, there's a reward waiting for us too. Okay? We need to finish strong so that we can inherit our reward. There will be obstacles in our Christian race. There will be temptations to face. Jesus faced them too. But with the help of Scripture, he conquered them all. Same thing for us. With the help of Scripture, we can conquer them all. Okay? Jesus wants us to finish strong just like he did. And when we finish this race called life, we have a waiting for us, not some lousy certificate or trophy like I received, but we have eternity in heaven. Amen. Yeah, for those of you who have trophies, what good are they for you? You know, mine are all on a cardboard box, not, not doing much good. The kids will get them out every now and play with them. Look, Daddy used to be an athlete. <laughs> yeah, you know. Doesn't do me any good now. Doesn't do me any good now. But heaven lasts forever. Heaven lasts for eternity. Now quickly back to the hymn. Let me finish that up. The editor of a hymn on needing a new hymn for his book joined these thrilling stanzas with a tune that George Webb had written for a poem called Tis Dawn the Lark is Singing for a show on board a ship somewhere in the Mid-Atlantic. 
The result is that in death, Dudley Atkins Ting preached more widely and more successfully than he ever did while he was alive. Perhaps that is why God allowed him to suffer the fate that he did. Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus has inspired untold millions to nobler Christian living. Now, I hope that you will have the courage to stand up, and I hope that you will have the courage to stand up and bear Christ's banner. I hope you have the courage to stand up and attack the enemy, and I hope you have the courage to stand up and put on your gospel armor. But I really hope that you have the courage to stand up and finish strong. Let's start doing that by standing and closing our eyes, and let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for your strength, and we pray for your help in this time that we live in. And there's no shortage of enemies. And Lord, all the things that we see going around us now are all the doings of Satan. That's our enemy, Lord. This is all Satan's doings. And let hope us not to lose focus of that, Lord. It's a spiritual battle that is encompassing our country. And the way to fight the spiritual battle, Lord, is to get in the fight with you as our captain, to pray unceasingly, to rely on your word, and to keep our eyes upon you and not upon Washington, D.C. Lord, if we keep our eyes on man, they will let us down every time, and we know that. No matter how great the man, Lord, we're all still just men. And help us, Lord, to remain faithful and keep our eyes upon you, no matter what is going on around us, to remain faithful to you and keep our testimony pure, Lord, so that when someone looks at us and the times are bad and we, we could uh, do many things, Lord, that we fleshly and worldly, that we put that aside, Lord. We resist the temptation to do that. We keep our focus on you, Lord, and keep our testimony pure. But we stay in the fight, Lord, and stand up for you. Be with us this evening during this invitation time now, and I ask these things in your name. Amen. If you would, just sing this song. It's not a typical invitation song, but it's in 502 of your hymnal. 502. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Of the cross, lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, shall he lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord. On the second and the last, stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call of aim. For to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day, ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength. Uh, on the last, stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long this day. The next, the victor song to him that overcometh a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternal 